Let me start off by saying I encountered something very terrifying when I was on patrol this past April in Texas. It wasn't of this world and its face was half off. I was on patrol in the middle of the night. I was with my partner and we were driving along the road which goes through a sparsely populated forest. We had just passed a house and there wasn't much around us. It was very quiet. I remember looking out my window and seeing something move quickly behind the trees. It looked like it was crouching down with its head tilted to the side as if it was looking at me. I told my partner to stop so I could get out and take a look around. As soon as I got out of the car, I could see this thing crawling on the side of the road. When I shined my flashlight on it, it was in the shape of a human, but it was hairless and white as a ghost with these large black eyes. Its face was missing on one side like it had been rotted off or it was damaged in some type of accident. It wasn't human because it was much taller and thinner than any human. Its arms were disproportionately long for its body. It was making this low growling and hissing noise as it was crawling on the side of the road. Now I've seen a lot of things as an officer, but I tell you this was truly terrifying. It was so terrifying that I dropped my flashlight and ran back to the car. My partner looked at me like I was crazy, but he didn't see what I saw. He asked me what happened, and I told him that there was something crawling on the side of the road. He got out of the car, and he shined his flashlight on it. When he did, this thing stood up, its head tilted back, as if it were looking at us. It had these large black eyes with no eyelids or eyebrows, just two black holes in its face. It made this loud hissing noise again, and then started walking towards us like a zombie would in a horror movie. My partner quickly turned back to the car, and we drove off as fast as we could. He barely got in the door as he was taking off. I know the dash cam and body cams got this thing on tape. When we got back to the station, we reviewed the footage, and it got all fuzzy when we encountered this thing, like the tracking is messed up on an old VCR tape. I don't know what this thing was. Maybe one of your listeners has experienced something like this in the past. This happened just west of San Antonio. I worked as a police officer in a small town in rural Nebraska. Back in the 90s, I was patrolling through town in the winter. We had several abandoned houses in town but one seemed to have the attraction of copper thieves, so we were told to keep an eye on it. I drove by it around 7 p.m. Since it sat on a corner lot, I had a clear view of all four sides of the house. As I drove around the corner, nothing looked out of the ordinary. About two hours later, I drive by again, and the back door is wide open. I know that the back door was not open when I drove by it earlier. Looking at the snow on the ground around the house, there were no footprints, so I think, what the hell? I call dispatch and tell him I'm investigating an open door at the address and ask for a county sheriff to start my way. I walk to the open door, pull out my flashlight, and shine it inside. The house has obviously been gutted for the most part. The plaster walls have been torn down, debris piles everywhere. Since there were no footprints in the snow around the door other than mine, and with all the dust on the floor not showing any footprints, I chalk it up to the wind or maybe the door just opened on its own. I was about to secure the door when I heard this loud thump coming from upstairs and what sounded like kids laughing. So I enter the house and I yell out, Police department, come downstairs. I hear more of those sounds of kids playing. I tell dispatch that it sounds like there are kids in the house and start making my way through the kitchen into the living room, where the stairs are, all the while cautiously checking the main floor. Two more times I hear something upstairs, but since I've had no response, I start thinking maybe it's an animal. Still, I hear what I swear was kids laughing. I head upstairs, and it gets all quiet. The upstairs is relatively small, with a hallway at the top of the stairs that has one bedroom on the right 
one street ahead at the end of the hall, and a bedroom on the left. As I get to the top of the stairs, I hear a thump in the bedroom to the left. I carefully peek inside the door, and it's an empty room with a small pile of plaster and wood debris in the middle. No kidding. Sitting on top of the pile of debris was a page torn out of a child's book with a picture of a police officer on it. The hair stood up on the back of my neck so quickly, I got out of that room and quickly cleared the other rooms upstairs and got the hell out of there. I told dispatch nobody was in the house. I locked the back door and I never went back in there again. My uncle works for dispatch in my town, and he recently told my family the weirdest call he's ever received. He said that he received a call from a landline one night when he answered it. There was only static on the other end. This happened two more times. Finally, he calls a squad to go check out the address from the caller ID. When the cop got there and walked into the house, they immediately saw that there was a dead body. The person had been dead for five months. The craziest part about it was that there was no electricity or other utility working. So there is no way they should have been able to get those calls into dispatch. But if they hadn't, who knows how long that body would have stayed there. I was doing security work for a hospital with the ER, ICU, and surgical, the whole works. And I got called to several paranormal calls. Most were sight cases or paranoid people that heard a strange noise. This time, more than one nurse saw a guy on camera who was on his desk bed. A guy who kept saying earlier that day, I will not die in a hospital. He literally pushes his curtain aside and walks out of his room towards the elevator. A code was called and everybody immediately posted at their designated locations. Within seconds, there were people watching the elevators and the stairs, and security started combing the area and investigating. As I reached the ICU floor, I spoke with the lead nurse, and she told me that several of the nurses saw him leave. At that moment, monitors started going off. The guy never left. The guy went code blue and died right then. There were three witnesses on the report that say he got up and left, and were serious enough to call a code which could cost them their jobs if they were wrong. The bosses wouldn't let us watch the video, but the looks on their faces said it all. The bosses said that the nurses did the right thing, and some things just can't be explained. The portion of the video I was allowed to see showed that nobody had left via an elevator or stairs. My uncle was the sheriff of a small town in New Mexico. He was the most hardcore person in our family, super straight-laced, and wasn't at all a joker in any way. When he told this story, which was backed up by my aunt, we believed it without question. There was this local reporter named Bob D. He would always show up at any major police activity from a police scanner, anything worth reporting in the local paper. Everybody on the force knew Bob. He was around at least once or twice a week at various police activities. Bob was a bit of a joker himself. He would mess with people by flicking them behind the ears. People would react to the flicks thinking that it was a bug only to turn around to see it was Bob jerking around. Everybody liked Bob, though. Unfortunately, Bob had stage 4 lung cancer and died pretty suddenly. His wife buried him against his wishes. He wanted to be cremated. For the next couple of weeks after his funeral, people kept talking about seeing Bob at a car wreck, fires, and all the same stuff that he used to report on. There were 20 or 30 reports like this from civilians and members of the force alike. My uncle didn't buy it, though, until the night he and my aunt showed up at our house. Gun drawn, pale as paper. We asked him what happened and he had to sit down and take his breath, compose himself, and start to outline what had happened. 
This is a guy who I had never seen get rattled by anything. He said my aunt and him were sitting on the couch in their house watching TV. My uncle kept scratching his ear over and over. Finally, my aunt asked him what was the problem, and he turned around just in time to see their bedroom door open. Bob D. was standing in the doorway clear as day. My uncle jumped up, cussed or something, and got my aunt's attention, who turned to see him there too. As soon as they both made eye contact with them, Bob just smiled, turned, and walked across the living room and out their front door. He closed the door behind himself and was gone. My uncle got control of himself and ran outside, gun drawn looking for Bob, but he was gone. At that point, they just ran over to our place. We went over there, but we didn't see anything, and my aunt and uncle stayed at our place for the rest of the night. The next day, Ellie dies in the force were giving my uncle lots of, we told you so. People around town said that they saw Bob show up at police scenes for at least another two to three months. My dad even saw him in our dark room in our basement with a friend. He was flicking their ears in the dark. Three months after he was gone, people continued to see him and kept saying he was looking worse and worse. My uncle saw him two more times each time confirming he was looking more and more worn out. My dad had concluded that he was decomposing and his ghost was reflecting that process. Every time my ear itches, I get goosebumps now. Police officer here. One evening about eight years ago, it was pouring outside and we got a call from an elderly woman. She called in and she said that she was hearing footsteps inside of her house. She thought there was a ghost inside because she regularly heard the sound of someone walking upstairs. But she lived alone. We went to check it out and to make sure everything was okay. She stayed on the line with the 911 operator because she was frightened. About three minutes after she initially called in, she said that there was actually a man standing outside in her backyard staring at her through her sliding glass door. Petrified, the woman froze in that spot and continued to stare directly at the man. For the next minute or two, she said he was just standing there as still as could be staring at her. Eventually, the man slunk off out of sight. When we arrived about 12 minutes after the call first came in, we went to the front door. I remained in the foyer with the woman, and the other officer went to the backyard to see if the man was still hiding out, or if there was any traces of him. I spoke with her for several minutes until the other officer returned. He said there was no trace of anyone having been in the backyard. We set off to do a quick sweep before we left the house to make sure the house is all clear. In her living room, the room that has the sliding glass door, we discovered a trail of mud and footprints inside the house. I asked the woman if she had been outside at all that day, or if anyone had been over to visit. She said no, that she lived alone, and that no one came by to visit. The woman was probably around 85, and she had pretty poor eyesight and was hard of hearing. The woman obviously had seen the man's reflection and mistakenly thought he was in front of her on the other side of the glass door in her backyard. But in reality, he had been standing only a few feet behind her in the same room while she had been talking to 911. Nothing was stolen, broken, or out of place, so we don't know what his intentions were. Who knows what would have happened had she not stayed on the line with the operator. I'm a security patrol officer in Scottsdale, Arizona. I typically work the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. I have the largest security beat in the Scottsdale desert, and part of my job is to respond to alarm calls in these isolated mansions throughout Scottsdale, Cave Creek, and Carefree. One night, I got an alarm call at a small airport where the rich play with their airplanes. Sky Ranch Airport, to be exact. Part of the airport are residential homes with built-in hangars, and that's where the alarm was tripped at 2.30 a.m. On arrival, I went through the normal alarm process, 
call dispatch to make a call to the homeowners, which is vacant, so no one should be there. After the call is made, I knock on the front door very aggressively just to make sure if someone is home, they'll hear me before I make an entry. I've walked in on homeowners before at a different house. Anyway, as I walked towards the front door, I heard a little shuffling noise behind the door. Very faint, but loud enough to be noticed. That being the case, I rang the doorbell and knocked on the door longer than usual. And nothing. So I then began the perimeter check, and I found that the back sliding door handle was broken. But there was a little note on the inside that read, Handle was broken, Realtor. The realtor placed a metal rod down to keep the sliding glass door from opening. I finished the perimeter check, called dispatch to let them know I was going to make an entry. The house was beautiful and everything was fine. So I wrote all my entry slip and was resetting the alarm, but a fault showed on the display that read Zone 35 back room door. At that very moment, my supervisor called me via radio and asked if I knew anything about the house I was in. What he told me more than anything just annoyed me. He said back in 2008, the previous homeowner committed suicide by the front door with a shotgun when the economy crashed, and left behind a wife and three kids. I knew he was trying to scare me, so I brushed it off and resumed my business. I walked to the back sliding door, and lo and behold, the metal rod was removed, in the sliding glass door was open about four inches. That alone was creepy. The house has motion sensors, including sensors on the door itself, and none of them were showing up as faulted. I put the rod back into its original place and armed the system. A few months later, I had an alarm call at a different house, and this time the Scottsdale police assisted me. After the call was over and done with, we stood outside the home BSing, and I asked the police if they knew about the house in Sky Ranch Airport. One of the officers said he was one of the first police officers on the scene shortly after the homeowner committed suicide. They confirmed the suicide, and if I ever respond to that house again, I'll make sure I ask for backup. This happened a few years ago when I was on patrol at Yosemite National Park. I was on a two-person patrol in the backcountry of the park, where we were responsible for patrolling a large area and responding to any emergencies. It was just before sunrise, so it was still pretty dark outside. We had been out all night and were heading back to the ranger station in my truck when my partner said he needed to take a leak. We pulled off the road onto this wide spot with some trees and got out of the truck. My partner said he'd be right back, so I decided to stand outside. As I stood there looking around, I heard this growl coming from about 50 to 75 yards away down a hillside. It was pretty dark out, and I thought it was probably a mountain lion. I had heard that sound many times before while out on patrol. I stood there for another minute, and then my partner finally came back from behind the truck and he said, sounds like a mountain lion, and it sounds close. We both get back into the truck when we see something take off across the road. It happened so fast it was like a blur, but whatever it was that ran across the road was huge and had dark brown fur. We sat there for another minute trying to figure out what it was. Now keep in mind that the sun hadn't come up yet, so it was still kind of hard to see but we did see something go across the road, and we could make out that it was large, and it had dark brown fur. As we're sitting there, we hear this faint crying noise coming from the hillside below us. It sounded like a baby crying. My partner and I got out of the truck with our flashlights, and we started going towards this sound. As we go down the hillside, the crying gets louder and louder. When we finally get to where the crying is coming from, Sure enough, there is a baby there, but it's not a human baby. Well, this is where the story gets weird. This thing is like a cross between a human and a wolf. At the moment, I'm beside myself and kind of in shock, standing there, looking at what seems to be some type of werewolf creature in front of me. The mother must have been what we saw at the top of the road. 
My partner picks it up and starts walking up the hill. I said, wait, are you sure that is the right move? Because we just saw that run across the road and it looked huge. It could come back at any second. He said, we can't leave this baby out here by itself. So we head back up the hill and get into the truck and take the baby back to the ranger station. This thing is making all kinds of weird noises and opening its mouth like it's hungry. It didn't have a full set of teeth, but it had well-developed canines in its front teeth. The morning shift came in about an hour after we got back to the station, and my boss said he was going to make some phone calls and he will take care of it. My partner and I went home for the day, but I thought about that little creature until my shift that night. Fast forward to that night when I came back into work, I asked around to some other rangers what happened to that baby that we brought in. They said, what baby? I told them what had happened and they kind of chuckled saying, yeah, right. So I sent my boss a text asking what happened. He said it's taken care of and that's the end of it. And don't mention this to anybody else. I pried again saying, what do you mean? What happened to that baby? He said, if you want to keep your job, then you need to keep this to yourself and not ask any questions. It has been handled and we need to shut down that area of the park for the next 14 days. So that was the end of it. I've never heard anything since. I left there last year and it's still a mystery to me what this thing was. But whatever it was, they don't want us to know, that is for sure. And this happened just last week, so the story is still developing. I've been a park ranger for the last 12 years. I've worked in several different parks, but the majority of my time has been spent in one particular park. The park is surrounded by thousands of acres of undeveloped land, and there are only two roads that enter the park. Both are gravel and not maintained during the winter months. The nearest town is about 15 miles away, and it's very hard to get cell phone service out here. I've had many odd experiences working here, but this one takes the cake. I received a call from another ranger who was patrolling one of our backcountry campsites. He said that he found a campsite that was in complete disarray and there were signs of a struggle. He asked me to come out and take a look at the site. I arrived about 15 minutes later and walked into the camp area with him. The first thing I noticed was the tent was halfway knocked over, but it appeared as if somebody had done it intentionally because half the stakes were pulled out of the ground. There were also large drag marks leading from the tent to an old fire pit where someone had dug up some charcoal and scattered it around. The second thing I noticed was that there were several pieces of broken glass spread out through the campsite, which is unusual for this park because we don't allow glass containers of any kind in our backcountry sites. We have bears and other wildlife in this park, so we don't want people leaving behind anything that could potentially harm them or their food supply. I went to the tent looking for any signs of who may have been staying there, when I came across a sleeping bag that had blood on it, and I mean a lot of blood, and the tent smelled horrible, like rotted garbage. At this point, my heart started racing because I knew something serious had happened here, but I still didn't know exactly what took place or who may have been involved. I called local law enforcement, and about 20 minutes later, two sheriff deputies pull into the campsite, along with the state trooper who patrols this area regularly due to its remote location. They went through the campsite and looked into the tent and found the blood-stained sleeping bag. They took pictures of everything and marked off the area so no one would come in and disturb anything. The sheriff's deputies had to put on masks because this smell was so strong inside of the tent. After they were done, I was able to talk to them about what had happened. They told me it looked like somebody was beaten and drugged outside the tent and into the woods. They found signs of a struggle and some large clumps of reddish-brown fur. It was much larger than the fur of a bear. Search and Rescue is actively searching for this man. I'm praying that we find him. This happened last fall in southern Florida. 
I was driving down the road when out of nowhere a man runs in front of my patrol car. I didn't have time to stop, so I hit him at 40 miles per hour. As soon as I hit him, his body flew into the air and landed on the top of my car. It sounded like an explosion had gone off inside my car, and the windshield shattered from the impact. The man's body slid off my hood and fell onto the ground with a thud. I jumped out of my car and ran over to where he landed. His head had hit a rock that was sticking up from the ground, so there was blood everywhere. There were shards of glass stuck in his face, arms, legs, and chest, and he wasn't moving at all. I called for help on my radio while I checked for signs of life. When I touched his neck to feel a pulse, he was dead. No heartbeat, and he wasn't breathing. While I was on my radio looking at him, his head snapped up towards me with a look of pure rage on his face. He grabbed onto me with both hands and pulled me towards him until we were nose to nose. His eyes were glowing like red fireballs. He started screaming at me in some language that I've never heard before. It sounded like somebody was torturing animals right next to your ear. Then he bit down hard into my shoulder with his teeth. They felt like they were made out of steel or something because they cut right through my uniform shirt like it wasn't even there. I screamed at him to let go because it hurt like hell. But he kept biting harder into me until all that came out were gurgling sounds from deep within his throat. As soon as he stopped biting me, he let go and stood up straight again like nothing had happened. I grabbed my gun from its holster and pointed it at him. I told him to get on the ground, but he just stood there staring at me with those red eyes of his. He still had glass shards all over his face. I told him to get on the ground and then he bends over and grabs a large rock and throws it at me. I didn't have time to dodge it and it hits me in the chest knocking me down. He threw it with such force. I aimed my weapon at him and pulled the trigger, shooting him in the chest three times. He didn't even flinch. The bullets went right through his chest without doing any damage. Blood was spraying everywhere, but he kept walking towards me like nothing happened. I emptied my entire clip into him, but he still kept coming towards me until the ambulance arrives. I could hear the sirens that made him turn away and start running into the woods. They started treating my bite wounds while I tried to explain what had happened. The guy died on impact with my car, so how could he still be walking around? It all happened so fast, it's like time slowed down or something when he came towards me. I could see every detail of his face and everything around us was crystal clear. It felt like an eternity before he let go of my shoulder and stood up straight again. The ambulance took me to the hospital where they treated me for my wounds and gave me some painkillers for the bite marks on my shoulder. When I got home later, there were bite marks all over my shoulder and neck from him. My wife freaked out when she saw them all over. We had a team of police searching the woods for five hours looking for this man. There were no signs of him anywhere. I can't explain what or who this thing was. Do you have any ideas? I'm a police officer in the city of Detroit. I've been with the police department for about five years now, and I've seen some crazy things. But nothing like what happened to me last month. It was 2.30 a.m. when my partner and I were patrolling our normal beat. We were driving down a residential street when all of a sudden my partner says, What the hell is that? I look over and I see this bright light in the sky. It was hovering above the tree line. I pulled over to get a better look. My partner and I both get out of the car and start walking towards where we see this light. As we walk closer to it, we could hear this high-pitched noise coming from it. It sounded like something was screaming, but no words were being said. We looked at each other because neither one of us had ever heard anything like that before. We kept walking towards it, until it reached the edge of the woods where we saw what looked like a huge craft with lights on all sides hovering about a hundred feet off the ground. We stood there for about five minutes just watching this thing hover above us making that screaming noise 
until finally my partner says let's go back to the car and call this in. That's the last thing I remember. I woke up on the ground next to my partner and it was 6 a.m. I tried to shake him awake but he was still out cold. I looked at him and he had this huge gash on his forehead and there was dried blood all over his face. I continued to try to wake him up but he just wouldn't wake up. So I got back to the car and called dispatch immediately. They told me that they had other reports of people seeing this thing in different parts of the city. They also sent an ambulance for my partner. We both ended up at the hospital where they ran some tests on us. We were there for about six hours before they let us go home. My partner was eventually okay. We took a few days of leave and went into work the next week. But our captain tells us that we're being put on desk duty until further notice because of what had happened. He said that nobody knows what it is or where it came from. We haven't been allowed back on patrol since then, which has been about three weeks now. So I don't know if anybody else has seen this thing since then, or if anybody knows anything more about what's going on than we do right now.